Okay, so uh, good afternoon and welcome. After the inevitable technical hitch whenever we have uh, uh, something on, on the digital, uh, I'd like to uh, offer you a very, very warm uh, welcome uh, to this first event in the Digital Visual Cultural uh, Series. Uh, my name is Gillian Rose. Uh, I'm the Professor of Human Geography uh, here uh, at the University of Oxford. Uh, I now can't see any of you, so if I look vague, <laughs> that's the reason. Um, I'm curating this series of events, this digital visual cultural series of events, and with Shannon's permission, I'd just like to take a couple of minutes to say a few words about it before I introduce her. Um, so for some time now uh, in, in my research, I've been looking at and, and thinking with and through uh, a range of digitally created images. Uh, so the thinking started with uh, a project at least 15 years ago, I think, looking at family photography. Uh, and at that point, family snaps, um, uh, digital cameras were very expensive, quite unusual things. They also still looked like cameras, you know, boxes with lenses on front. Uh, and very few um, uh, people were using, uh, relatively few, were using photo sharing websites, which kind of seems like ancient history now. Um, I then moved on to another project, uh, looking again at computer-generated images, uh, this time photorealistic architectural renders and the ways in which they were intervening in the architectural design process. And I'm now looking at images in relation to what are called smart cities. Uh, smart cities uh, are uh, cities that, that generate and then analyze very large digital data sets, and they are full of very many different kinds of digitally uh, produced uh, imagery. Um, uh, kind of advertising, the hype, uh, policy documents are full of data visualizations, there are apps and interfaces, dashboards, maps with real-time data feeds, uh, images of what driverless cars see as they, as they travel through roads and so on and so on. Now those are all quite specialist, uh, I guess, uses, uh, productions of, of quite particular kinds of, of digital uh, images. But it's also clear now, I think, that digital images are really pervasive. Uh, there's a huge range of digital visualising technologies. Uh, if you have a smartphone, you're carrying quite a wide range of them uh, about your person all the time. And they mediate uh, you know, so much of our everyday experiences, both uh, intimate and public. So our family snaps, the films and TV we watch, the games we play, the maps we follow, social media that we use on these large, small screens as we watch and stroll and play and work and wander in our, in our everyday lives. And that apparent ubiquity of uh, uh, digital um, uh, imagery is the focus of this series of events that I've uh, decided to call Digital Visual Cultural. Uh, it's a series. Uh, I'm hoping that something will be happening uh, every six months or so. So please do uh, follow us on, on Twitter, check in on our, our website. You can see the, uh, the, the tags and addresses uh, on, the, on the slide there uh, for, for news of, of what's happening. Um, and what I, I would like that series of, of events to do is, is to look at those images, those digital images, that, the technologies that, that are, are enabling their production and, and their circulation, their sharing, their, their modification, their multiplication. But also, and I think much more importantly, um, I think we, we're going to be asking in this series about what, what, what difference is this making? What kind of effects are, are these new, new things, new, new practices, or, or perhaps old things and practices, what, what, what effects are they having uh, in the world? So the split series will, will be asking whether a new way of seeing, new ways of seeing uh, might be emerging with these digital visualising uh, tech in all its different forms. And if new forms of, of seeing are uh, emerging, if a new visual culture is, is emergent, we'll be asking about its conditions uh, and, and its consequences. So, for those of us interested in those kinds of, of questions and issues, the work of uh, Professor Shannon Mattern, who's uh, in, lingering in the shadows here, sort of like, um, has been an absolutely indispensable guide for, for, for some time now. And I was so happy when Shannon agreed to, uh, to come and, and uh, uh, give a lecture uh, at this um, opening event for, for the, the series. Uh, and Shannon has also very kindly agreed to take questions afterwards, uh, and there will then be a, a reception outside. So Shannon Matten is uh, Associate Professor of Media Studies in the School of Media Studies at the New School in New York. Uh, and she's also a contributing editor to a really excellent online journal called Places. And if you don't know that, I, I suggest you, you, you go to take a look. It's a really, really great, great read. Uh, Shannon's writing and teaching focuses on archives, libraries, and other media spaces, on media infrastructures, and mediated sensation, particularly uh, uh, urban sensations. 
She's the author of uh, The New Downtown Library, Deep Mapping the Media City, and most recently a fantastic book called Code and Clay, Data and Dirt, 5,000 Years of Urban Media, uh, all of which I, I find really uh, exemplary uh, mixes of very savvy use of theory, but also very deep archival research. They're, they're all wonderful reads. So it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Shannon now, and I look forward to hearing her, her talk on uh, 50 Eyes on a Scene. Thank you very much, Shannon. So thanks very much for that warm welcome. Everyone always says from the podium they can't see the audience, but this is totally true. This spotlight is so bright, I can see none of you. And also, as you can see, I am playing the American role. I did not do this intentionally. I'm wearing red, white, and blue. But um, this might be a very American talk, and maybe I should preemptively apologize for that, too. And also, I've kind of expanded the scope a bit. I realize 50 is not enough. So what we're going to be talking about is 50,000, maybe even 50 million eyes on a scene by the time we get to the end of this. So um, I can't help but start with this. A year and a half ago, when a wild card candidate won our presidential election, many of us assumed that the upset was due in part to a failure of recognition, a failure similar to the one you faced here in the UK with Brexit two years ago. Just days after the votes were cast, historian Tyler Stovall proclaimed, for me, the election Donald, sorry, for me, the election Donald Trump underscore, of Donald Trump, that is, underscores the Brexit vote in the UK. Both represent a profound anger at globalization by those who see themselves as, as its losers. And mixed in with that is a substantial amount of xenophobia and racism. Leave and Trump voters purportedly failed to see themselves in the personnel and policies of recent administrations fail to see for themselves, a future for themselves and their families in a deindustrialized economy, fail to see their interests represented in current Im immigration and trade and energy and environmental policies, and often fail to see people of color, particularly those seeking advancement or asylum, as anything other than undeserving others, invaders, takers. In the US, some members of the liberal elite soon recognized their own failures of recognition. Those in media and policy had been overlooking a sizable segment of the American population, the white working class. And thus came a spate of studies of the left behind. Carol Anderson's White Rage, Justin Guest's The New Minority, Arlie Hus Russell Hutch um, Hutchchild's Ch Strangers in Their Own Land, Nancy Eisenberg's White Trash, Robbie Shilliam's Race in the Undeserving Poor, J.D. Vance's Hill uh, Hillbilly Elegy, which is probably the best known of the bunch, and Joan Williams' White Working Class. Even the sitcom Roseanne made a short-lived return to primetime television. I'm not sure if that news has reached you of the debacle around this show. Um, many of the myriad reviews and omnibus reflections that address these books and cultural productions in tandem ultimately acknowledge that the white working class label tends to elide important distinctions within the category and, as Shilliam proposes, overlooks a colonial history that distinguishes between the deserving white poor and the undeserving non-white poor. All this is to say, failures to see and be seen, both literally and metaphorically, are a significant factor in the recent political transformation in the US and UK and around the world. And this is the perceptual and political context in which we should consider the rise of new technologies of recognition and identification. Technologies that enact and entrench policies of segregation and moral codes of justice or injustice. Perhaps some of these tools like drones and sensors and facial recognition software aren't new, but recent revelations have demonstrated just how pervasive they are in the state security apparatus and its administrative imaginary, what it would like to be if it were realizing its full potential. So within the past few months alone, especially within the past month, in the aftermath of Facebook's Cambridge Analytica scandal, we've learned that Google, through Project Maven, has been providing uh, artificial intelligence to the Department of Defense for the analysis of drone footage, with the hopes of eventually developing machine learning algorithms to surveil entire cities. That's a quote. Microsoft declared that it was proud to support, another quote, U.S. Immigrations and Custom Enforcement's work in implementing the transformative technologies for homeland security and public policy or public safety. General Manager Tom Keene explained in a blog post from early 2018, which was then taken down and then reinstated, quote, this can help employees make more informed decisions faster with Azure government enabling them to process data on edge devices or utilize deep learning capabilities to accelerate facial recognition and identification, end quote. 
The revelation, amidst the news that the Trump administration was separating families at the U.S. border, incited a serious backlash. After employee protests at both companies, Google and Amazon, or Microsoft that is, Amazon shareholders and employees then demanded that their company stop marketing and uh, selling its recognition, that's R-E-K-O-G-N-I-T-I-O-N, facial recognition software to police departments and government agencies, who the American Civil Liberties Union warned could use it to track undocumented immigrants or activists, all those undeserving others. They also want to boot Palantir, the data analytics firm that undergirds many cities' predictive policing operations and supports Immigration and Customs, ICE, that's the acronym, ICE's detention and deportation programs. They wanted to boot them from Amazon Web Services, too. So as we gather to celebrate the launch of Jillian's new digital visual culture research program, we have to admit that digital visual culture has had a pretty bad month, or a pretty bad spring, I guess you could say. But perhaps change is coming. The workers are revolting, resigning, and organizing. The tech industry's pay and perks have tended to suppress workers of movements, but that's changing. These laborers want to be seen and heard, too. And as Google engineer Liz Fong Jones told Wired Magazine recently, they're choosing to recognize their position within a larger system. Quote, something that I'm glad to see changing is that employees had a sense of, we can't possibly affect this. We're just going to do our little piece, or, I don't know what this is being used for and I don't care, um, but I think that's changing, she said. That change is partly a consequence of workers recognizing their own role in creating a context for the politics of recognition and seeing what vulnerabilities and injustices seeing technologies themselves can exploit or affect. And what we see in recognizing these layers and vectors of visibility and invisibility is that visibility itself Recognition, being seen, isn't a panacea or an inherent good. Of course, Hegel, Hannah Arendt, Alex Honeth, Jürgen Habermas, Nancy Frazier, Charles Taylor, Wendy Brown, and a host of others have long debated the politics of recognition. But what does recognition mean in the age of this kind of recognition? How has our new digital terrain changed the way in which recognition is operationalized? Consider the realm of social media. As the Data and Society Research Institute has demonstrated, various left-behind subgroups, from white nationalists to men's rights groups to the alt-right, are taking advantage of current media ecosystems, with the current media ecosystem, with its dependence on sensationalism and novelty and metrics, to, quote, manipulate news frames, set agendas, and propagate misinformation. They're practicing attention hacking to increase the visibility of their ideas, to commandeer some form of recognition that they think they have lacked. At the border, technologies like drones, passports, facial recognition software, motion sensors, and long-range cameras serve to recognize illicit activity, unsanctioned advances, and unwanted subjects, while also validating the deserving cohort who belong, who are welcome. The recognition and exclusion of illegals, quote unquote, at the border, in turn signals validation, inclusion, to those among the nationalist right who regard immigration as an economic and cultural threat and illegal immigration as a personal affront. My colleague Miriam Tickton, an anthropologist at the New School, notes that the concept of humanitarianism, which we might call a form of moral recognition, is also problematic. The border apparatus, including its technologies of recognition, she says, quotes, quote, sets up a distinction between innocence and guilt. The quintessential humanitarian victims bear no responsibility for their suffering. Their innocence is what qualifies them for their suffering, end quote. And children, she says, are usually the face of humanitarianism, unless, that is, they are contaminated by association with the violence from which they're fleeing. Many of those supposed supplicants arriving at the U.S.'s southern border, Donald Trump presumes, are murderers, rapists, drug dealers, and animals, all words he's used. Of the countless unaccompanied minors allegedly fleeing from the MS-13 gang in Central America, he warned, they could look so innocent. They're not innocent. He exhorts us to recognize their latent potential to, quote, infest our country and to transform our once peaceful neighborhoods into blood-stained killing fields and to turn these people away. Yet babies and young children, perhaps still too young to be tainted, were, until recently, separated from their parents and sent to various tender age shelters in and around Brownsville, Texas. These innocents were the quintessential humanitarian victims, 
They were to serve as examples of Trump's tough zero tolerance policy and to deter further immigration. So here's why I should pause and acknowledge that what I've shared with you thus far bears very little resemblance to what I laid out in my abstract, the invitation to which you reply to come here, a pledge I made way back in March, well before I knew what a shit show the American spring would be. That promised talk was to be a speculative exploration of various seeing subjectivities, a multi-perspectival story of an urban scene told through various creaturely and machinic eyes. I promise I'll still offer some variation on that theme, but I have to admit that speculation has felt rather hollow to me in recent months, particularly as our evil clown administration acts out one dystopian Mike William Gibson story after another in real life. It's embarrassing too. I apologize on behalf of my country. What's happening at home is enraging and it's paralyzing, so much so that it was actually a little difficult for me to write this talk. I just couldn't make myself conjure up urban imaginaries when all the voices around me were speaking urgently of state-sanctioned child abuse and racial oppression, environmental degradation. Donald Trump just last week essentially is undoing any environmental pro kind of a proactive environmental regulations that Obama put into place, and resurgent fascism. I decided that I had to grapple with these concerns, even if it took me outside my areas of expertise. I've aimed to uphold my promise to talk with you about subjectivities and politics of seeing and spatiality, which I do know something about, and apply it to sites and topics that are a little bit unfamiliar, and familiar that is, and illusory, savage, and scary. So here I am, recognizing that I'm merely an amateur guide to the train that follows. I'm going to focus on border cities because they constitute the fulcrum of multiple forms of recognition and misrecognition, multiple ways of seeing and being seen, as well as multiple means of obfuscating and avoiding detection. Here, recognition can mean detection, the discernment of pixel patterns and signal processing. It can mean the acknowledgement of one's identity, the acknowledgement of one's humanity, appearance before one another, a la Arendt. For politicians, it involves maneuvering for status, seeking approval. And ideally, as Nancy Frazier advocates, recognition means regarding others as full members of society on equal status. All of these things can happen through border processes and politics. So it was those tender age shelters that really got me, not only because of the inhumane policies they represented, in which of course I recognize other things, similar things have been happening throughout history and around the world, but also because of what they represented, both semantically and visually. Consider the incongruity and hypocrisy of the name. What did this administration know about tenderness, which requires some recognition of the humanity and vulnerability of others? Steve Wagner of the Department of Health and Human Services told the Associated Press that his agency has specialized facilities that are devoted to providing care to children with special needs and tender age children, which we define as under 13. Yet many found the term to be a vile euphemism, including your folks here at The Guardian. What's more, it turned out that some shelters, quote unquote, offered little of the comfort and protection that their name implied. Of the 2,300 plus seized minors, many found themselves housed in, te in tent encampments, a former Walmart superstore, and a warehouse partitioned into cages, which again, some people didn't like that term. They're essentially wire enclosed rooms where the overhead lighting stayed on around the clock. And yes, some of these facilities were present under Obama too. Others ended up in privately operated facilities with a history of abuse and neglect, and still others were lucky to land in homey quarters with cribs and toys and books. Yet, quote, the shelters aren't the problem, said pediatrician Marcia Griffin. It's taking kids from their parents that's the problem, one that causes immediate trauma, which could then lead to long-term developmental issues. Those facilities are widely distributed, as we can see on a new interactive map released just this past Monday. A group of librarians and researchers generated the Torn Apart Separados, which depicts the expansive geography of immigration enforcement, including detention centers where families are torn apart, hence separados. By piecing, they did this by piecing together disparate sources of public data. They looked at government immigration records, tax forms, job listings, social media posts, and a variety of other forms of information. The government sought to control the narrative by using carefully framed digital photos and video to demonstrate that their underage charges were well cared for. They got clean beds and food and teddy bears and video games. They got exercise and health care. They were also reminded of the altruism of their caretakers. 
U.S. Customs and Border Protection and the Department of Health and Human Services have supplied all photos depicting the conditions inside this McAllen, Texas facility and others around, um, and many news outlets have chosen not to publish them on the basis that they're, they're essentially state propaganda. And because the inhabitants were minors whose privacy must be protected, we see none of their faces. As a consequence, we're denied the ability to recognize them as individuals. Instead, they function kind of like mannequins anonymously activating the space. They're kind of like the scalies and stock people entourages used in architectural renderings to show scale, to model aspirational uses of the design, and sometimes surreptitiously to embody particular social norms. Here, those norms are compliance, decorum, and earth-hued modesty, with small allowances made for personal expression, as we can see here. Values, we are perhaps led to assume they didn't learn from their transgressive parents. That order is visible on a macro scale, too, at the Torn Tornillos Tent City, not far from El Paso, Texas, which housed teenage boys. Getty Images offers a collection of Trevor Paglin light aerial images captured, I presume, by drone. And another set of photos of US mayors joining together at the port of entry on June 21st last week to call for the reunification of families. You can license each of these photos for $499 each if you're interested. From on high, the arid landscape populated with various structures for containment could maybe be mistaken for an oil refinery with its grid of storage tanks. Zooming in with cars and people imparting a sense of scale, we recognize that these are utility trailers and cream colored tents, each with an air conditioner attached to combat the 100 degree plus heat. That's Fahrenheit. So that's still pretty hot. Um, we see patrol vehicles and communications antennae. We see some stark last year at Marienbad style landscaping. We see staff in lime green t-shirts organizing boys into straight lines. And in another photo, peeking past a portico, we spy one of few sanctioned moments of abandon, boys playing football. On the periphery, where rolls of sod stretch partway across a rectangular plot, we see a field in becoming, perhaps a new recreational space. In revealing all the low, sprawling infrastructural components that allow this facility to function, the drone imagery, as Thomas Stubblefield explains, quote, articulates an authority that is distributed and elusive, wrapped up with the horizontality of networks, end quote. Yet these images allow us to contrast this system of power with another. We also see a farmer tending to some tender crops in a neighboring field. The normalcy of his actions, the freedom of his movement, and the act of casual care serve to highlight the impossibility, or probably less likelihood, lower likelihood, of these same privileges on the other side of the fence. The wide circulation of these government-sanctioned images, as well as some sur surreptitiously recorded audio captured inside one of the facilities, fed an increasingly incendiary public response, which ultimately led Trump to sign an executive order undoing his own policy of family separation last week. Still, the same video, vis sorry, visual technologies used to survey the government's detention facilities are also, we know, used to populate those facilities to recognize who belong inside. Customs and Border Protection has long used drones equipped with cameras and radar, and perhaps soon facial recognition technology, along with manned planes, helicopters, and coastal intercept vehicles to identify and intercept targets along the border. Humans are recognized here as visually identifiable or electromagnetically locatable objects. Quote, despite evidence that drones have been an extremely expensive and highly ineffective means of securing the U.S.-Mexico border, Stephen Graham writes, myths of total vision and absolute panopticism permeate the politics of drone deployment, end quote. They also make for great photo ops. Because drug smugglers use drones, too, to ferry in illegal substances, Border Patrol has deployed tethered aerostat radar systems, big blimps, to detect unauthorized low-flying aircraft. Additional surveillance footage is provided by fixed cameras mounted to towers and buildings and mobile systems to border, uh, attached to border control vehicles or carried by border agents. The agency expects contractors to provide equipment that can re recognize facial features, clothing, colors, and license plate numbers. These towers are also often equipped with radar, electro-optical, and infrared surveillance cameras to detect and track items of interest, items of interest and provide centralized operators with video and geospatial location of suspected items of interest for identification and appropriate action. 
These items of interest, whether human or not, are recognized, detected, identified, and geolocated as volumes and heat sources that are visible at night in fog amidst heavy vegetation, vegetation that is. Also part of this panoptical network are more human or humble technologies, like ground and imaging sensors that detect movement. At ports of entry, cameras snap photos of license plate, drivers' faces, and their cars, and x-ray scanners uh, scan the frames and contents of cars and trucks and trains. Trained dogs sniff for drugs, currency, and food. CPB agriculture, that's Customs and Border Patrol, agriculture specialists inspect passenger luggage, truck beds, train cars, and shipping containers for invasive species, insects, and other actionable pests. So many multisensory means of recognition, visual, thermal, and olfactory, textual and morphological, human and animal and machinic. In 2017, the dubiously named Palmer Lucky, known for developing the Oculus virtual reality headset and known <laughs> also for abetting a pro-Trump media, pro media manipulation campaign occurring during the 2016 election, left Facebook amid a fog of controversy. He joined forces with some ex-Palantir executives, secured money from Peter Thiel's Founders Fund, um, and launched what is called um, Enderil Industries. It's a Lord of the Rings reference. As some of you might know, I am not a Lord of the Rings person, so this is, I might not even be pronouncing it correctly, and if I am not, I apologize. And he used that funding to develop the Lattice surveillance system. Their 32-foot towers feature radar, communications antennae, and a camera clued together with a laser from a cosmetic hair removal device. At night, that laser will shoot out a beam that serves as a sort of long-distance flash. It's night vision on the cheap. But what most distinguishes this product is that the imaging technology is paired with artificial intelligence that can analyze its captured footage in order to, to distinguish humans from other moving objects within a two-mile radius. Quote, the company taught its software to identify the patterns of a person on the move, allowing it to avoid the expensive zoom lenses and thermal sensors used in competing systems. Wired's Stephen Levy reports that during a 10-week test period in Texas, Lattice helped custom agents catch 55 unauthorized border crossers and seize 982 pounds of marijuana. As the Department of Homeland Security reports, some of the most important advancements in increasing customs uh, situational awareness are in the area of data integration and exploitation. They're using technology to share data, including imagery, across multiple sites to coordinate law enforcement and intelligence databases and so forth. Again, Peter Thiel's Palantir helps on this front. The company's Analytical Framework for Intelligence integrates and analyzes personal data, including biographical information, addresses, fingerprints, and other bodily markers, social networks, travel itineraries, immigration records. From, they integrate them across federal, state, and law enforcement databases, including a legacy Bush-era registry of visitors from predominantly Muslim countries. According to the American Civil Liberties Union, other potential data sources include aviation and border watch lists, Homeland Security's Office of Biometric Identity Management's biometric databases, these are such long names, including all collected fingerprints, iris scans, palm prints, facial images, and the automated, automated that is, targeting system, which was once a cargo tracking system, was then expanded to people, and involves assigning all border crossers a risk assessment score. So many modes of recognition, all extracted from their context of collection and mashed together. Speaking of decontextualized interpretation, customs can also search your electronic devices, as you know, scan your social media accounts with all their self-curated digital images, and study your search results, too. Customs then, in turn, grants some of those agencies, including the people who were in charge of deportment, um, access to this centralized system. Edward Hasbrook, a consultant to the Identity Project, which is a civil rights organization, explains, when Trump uses the term extreme vetting, Palantir's analytical framework is, is the black box system of profiling al algorithms that he's talking about. These algorithms could be used to determine whether someone is permitted to cross or is forcibly pushed back over the border. They can predict people's future behaviors, and are supposedly claim to, and generate risk assessments. Relatedly, Palantir also builds and maintains ISIS Falcon intelligence system, such great algorithms which is used to track serious cross-border criminal activity. Because these proprietary systems conceal their logics of operation, we're unsure of the means by which they recognize targets of interest, 
and then direct government agents to intercept them in the field. There's no shortage of companies who want in on the border tech action. MIT, for instance, is probably working on a dozen nefarious projects at the very moment. And at, that was a dig, if you could tell. And at the University of Arizona, systems engineer um, Young, uh, sorry, I lost my place, Young Jun San is working with the Air Force to develop simulations intended to help uh, customs, which I'm just, rather than saying customs and border patrol, I'm just going to say customs, better understand the movement of crowds in various terrains and weather conditions, and to most effectively deploy unmanned drones or personnel on foot or in trucks. Because a lot of this is proprietary stuff, software. I don't have images to show you their use of digital visual imagery, hence the theme of the, of the series. But um, these textual representations are kind of proxies for what they're planning to do, essentially. As um, Gregoire Chamayu explains, such methods of data fusion parallel to the drone signature protocol and politics are uh, parallel the drone signature protocol and politics of recognition. Because drone surveillance, he says, is predicated on an analysis of behavior patterns rather than on the recognition of nominal identities, it claims to be able, paradoxically, to identify individuals who remain anonymous. In other words, to describe them by behavior that reflects a particular profile. This is identification that is not individual but generic. That was a long quote from Chamayu. A similar principle of recognition underlies Lucky's Lattice Project. As with the military's lethal drone operations, border patrol drone operators or surveillance monitors might be looking for targets engaged in suspicious tactical movements, suspicious that is, tactical movements. But here, even mere movement toward or just presence near the border is sufficient to raise suspicion. The potential integration of facial recognition technology, however, could make the drone's protocol more personal than generic. The patterns sought will be those among pixels to determine facial morphology rather than generalizable behaviors. While facial recognition technology has already been implemented at several airports, it's new, relatively new to land borders. And Congress Republicans seem to be very keen on implementing it as widely as possible. So this summer, excuse me, summer, the Andalusis Port of Entry in Texas is testing a new system bluntly named Vehicle Face System. As if you asked your child what to call this, it's just called Vehicle Face System. They'll capture images, or sorry, incoming and outgoing drivers' photos through their windshields and compare those images to photos on file in government holdings. New, what are called plantopic cameras, developed at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, use an array of sensors to capture as much light information as possible through multiple focal lengths, which allow them to then perceive depth despite any glare or tint that might be introduced by the windshield. You can essentially get a clear, relatively clear image through the windshield. As various government and agencies um, invite further public-private partnerships in this area, and as dozens of firms are fine-tuning the technology, Lee Fang and Ali Winston propose, <clears throat> the tipping point for our facial recognition might be right around the corner. Companies are developing systems to analyze dashboard and body camera footage, secure security camera feeds, and crowdsourced video, using it to locate abducted children, and as Moscow-based Vision Labs proposes, to survey entire cities and find criminal suspects, all through facial recognition um, technologies. Quote, biometric security is the big spearhead now, said Ali Schuler, a customs advisor. Once people start making money, having happier passengers, we'll start to see a gold rush effect. It's safe to say that migrants won't be among those happy passengers. One of those enterprising companies is Biometric Intelligence and Identification Technologies, again, very uncreative names, which offered law enforcement officers a free three-year trial of its software. They ate it up. Last year, 31 sheriffs, representing every county along the U.S.-Mexico border, voted to adopt tools that will capture, catalog, and compare individuals' iris data for use both in jails, jails that is, and out on patrol. Irises, the company proposes, are a more reliable means of recognition, since fingerprints can be disfigured through manual labor or self-inflicted wounds. Senior Vice President John Leonard acknowledges that its efforts will aid Trump's efforts in going after all those illegals. He acknowledges that while many immigrants may have made America great, there's a lot of assholes too, and that's a quote. Their technology is apparently particularly good at identifying assholes. So how do they do it? Agents take a high resolution image of an individual's iris, then create an individualized iris template that describes 240 unique characteristics 
compared to the 40 or 60 that you might get from a fingerprint. Then compare that profile against other scans in its private, private database. Sheriff Armar Lucio of Cameron County, Texas, told The Intercept that when it comes to intercepting unauthorized immigration, technology is the way to go. It's not unusual for people caught illegally from Mexico to give fake names and dates of birth, but it doesn't matter if what you have, uh, matter what, sorry, let me start that over, but it doesn't matter what you use if we have your features, your iris, your fingerprints. You can use a hundred different names. We can still say, this is the guy, because we have a picture of your iris. Names and dates and narratives are fallible sources of recognition. Nationality and citizenship are of little value too. Lucio, like Trump, seems to assume that bad hombres are all from Mexico. Yet the body's data we're yet to believe can't lie. Can't lie, that is. It represents identity indexically. Kelly Gates, Shoshana Amil Magnet, and Simone Brown argue otherwise. Their studies of biometric technologies demonstrate that they not only fail, up, fail to live up to their promises of objective, reliable recognition, but they also repeat historical misrecognitions of women, people of color, and people with disabilities. Louisa Moore claims that the rise of biometric borders results in the exercise of biopower such that the body itself is inscribed with and demarcates a continual crossing of multiple encoded borders, social, legal, gendered, racialized, and so on. Data from white, able-bodied, um, abled male bodies tend to con constitute the training set for these machines, which Brown says perpetuates the structured violence of a dialectics of recognition. And that mostly white male world still constitutes the training crew for our future border technologies. This is the group that made the Lattice Project. Consider Palmer Luckey's new venture. Lattice was merely an opportunity for Andrew Will to get its foot in the door at Homeland Security. It's the mesh infrastructure, the lattice, undergirding its vision for an augmented reality geographic near omniscience. Building upon his past work on the Oculus headset and drawing inspiration, as he said, from Lord of the Rings and Iron Man, Lucky now aims to merge VR with surveillance tools to create what Wired's Stephen Levy describes as a digital wall that is not a barrier so much as a web of all seeing eyes with intelligence to know what it sees. Andrew will present to you a digital world that mirrors the real one and recognizes each item of interest within that world with a quantifiable degree of certainty as either a person, an animal, a vehicle, or vegetation. Few other modes or granularities of being seem to matter in this borderland ontology. As Sandro Mazedra and Brett Nielsen argue in their border is method, the border is also an epistemological device which is at work whenever a distinction between subject and object is established. If that's the case, Andrew Will is a method for recognizing these taxonomic distinctions in the material world, for determining what items are of interest and deserving of action, interception, arrest, deportation, or sanction and welcome. Border as method, Mazadra and Nielsen Art continue, is about the relation of action to knowledge in a situation where many different knowledge regimes and practices come into conflict. Consider the knowledges and practices of the migrant family seeking a new life, or as Trump and, sheriff, and the sheriff brigade would have it, a new market for their illicit goods. The knowledges and practices of Homeland Security agents, which we know don't always coincide with the policies of the Trump administration. And the knowledges and practices of the ranchers across whose pastures those marked bodies are passing. Consider also the Mexican and American communities living within the 100 mile zone that according to Customs and Border Patrol, the border actually encompasses. In some places, these folks live inside a material landscape of surveillance, an ambient lattice of suspicion. Consider the olive sparrow, which might fly right over the border, right past the iris scanners and surveillance cameras, never to recognize their existence while they document his. The low-fying ferruginous pygmy owl, by contrast, along with grounded mammals like bighorn sheep, jaguars, and Mexican gray wolves confront the border head on, particularly where it's made manifest in the form of a wall. That wall, the most primitively analog of border visual and otherwise more than visual technologies, is the operative image writ, writ large. It visually communicates the presence of the border condition and all the epistemological and ontological shifts and protocols it entails. Walls are particularly appealing to Trump because they are pre-linguistic proclamations of power and control, tyrannical speech acts in concrete. They're also tools of interpolation, 
Depending upon our own status, we might recognize ourselves in its summon, home is just over there, or repudiation, you're not welcome here. The U.S.-Mexico border wall, which I must acknowledge is the focus of a study of several of my colleagues in what's called the Multiple Mobilities Research Cluster at the New School. So the border wall doesn't always follow the political border itself. It sometimes dips well into American or Mexican ter territory. And these geographical incongruities sometimes create existential and logistical dilemmas for residents whose addresses and passports declare one national identity, but who find themselves inhabiting another bureaucratic landscape. So your passport could say you're an American, but you're on the other side of the border wall. The wall's geopolitical significance means little to the border zone's non-human residents or passers through. Yet it serves even for them as a potent biopolitical, biopolitical force with profound existential significance. Animal welfare policies, for instance, mean that being a dog in El Paso is quite different than growing up canine in Juarez. And those wild animals, the deer and javelinas, whose pre-wall, even pre-Columbian existences were border agnostic, now find that this new anthropo anthropogenic obstacle interrupts their migration patterns and restricts their access to food and mates, thus delimiting the gene pool and potentially reorienting their genetic evolution. A border, whether materialized in uh, steel or patrolled and performed by various state apparatuses and surveillance and sensing technologies, means different things and calls for different responses from the different human, machinic, and creaturely beings who encounter it. How do they recognize the border, if at all, and the politics it embodies? How do they recognize one another vis-a-vis -vis the border? What ways of living together, of appearing before one another a la Arendt, are affected by the border dispositif? I suggest that another technology might shed some light on both the intimate and global dynamics of border recognition. Just wanna, the sound's gonna play underneath my conversations or my, my, diet, my monologue here, so I hope you can still hear both of us simultaneously. What you see behind me is Josh Begley's 2016 Best of Luck with the Wall, a video composed of 200,000 stitched together satellite images tracking the terrain that Trump's proposed border wall would have to traverse. Satellite imagery, despite its military origins and alienating distance, could actually help us recognize our own humanity in this often brutal terrain. From on high, we can see that in some places, the border sorts out urban conditions and populations. It divides prosperous, idyllic communities from de de desolate, crime-plagued cities. In other places, the border stands as a seemingly arbitrary divide between two connected communities, their people sorted only by an arbitrary national identity. Elsewhere, it uh, futilely bifurcates bodies of water. In still other places, the border functions almost as land art amidst an endless expanse of terrain. Begley's 30,000 mile view both establishes a critical distance and still allows us to affectively recognize, to witness local conditions and the glitches and gashes in the imagery itself, the sharp changes in contrast and fidelity and color, demonstrate the composite nature of this monolithic enterprise. Both the wall and its map are sutured together from thousands of individual pieces. It's each situated in place. From above, perhaps we recognize that despite all the techniques and technologies marshaled to reify it, to spectacularize it, to render it sublime, the border is in large part an epistemology performed and materialized, a way of seeing and sorting that's also simultaneously a mode of governing, one that has incited wars, launched expeditions and crusades, secured the fate of kings and kingdoms, divided families, altered evolution, and provoked actions that have, for millennia, reshaped humanity in the planet we live on. And that brings me to my final visual technology of border recognition, film. Daryl Meter, one of my former thesis advisees at the New School, is now a PhD student in cinema studies at NYU. On several occasions, she's a Texas native, and on several occasions she rode with the Doble Ruedas, Double Wheel, bicycle collective in Matamoros, Mexico, across the Rio Grande from Brownsville, Texas. Every week they organize inclusive, communally oriented rides throughout the city. They ride slowly over potholed streets, giving everyone a chance to lead the pack. And every once in a while, someone will yell out aburido, boring, thereby transforming this contested city, often sensationalized and demonized in the news and at the border, into just another everyday place. This is their everyday. And the bicycle gives them power to determine how to address and experience this place with their full bodies. Daryl's Super 8 footage aims to capture these analog affective geographies, 
See, she uses her bull legs to recognize the power of the cyclist's self-determined mobility in a terrain supposedly defined by, a restrict, by restrictive movement and to show how a sensorial encounter that exceeds the visual can serve to reframe borders so prone to overrepresentation and misrecognition. Thank you.